I'm pulling up in the taxi to my compound. Found my keys. <laughs> Can you imagine if I couldn't find my keys at this point? I've made it back to Beijing, and I'm finally about to walk into my apartment after months of being away. Here we go. Awesome. I'm in. <laughs> I am in my flat. It's great to be back. <laughs> I think I need to open the windows and air it out. A rare day of blue skies and no smog. It's almost as if I'd never left. The rest of the world suddenly seems so far away. On my taxi ride home through the city, delivery men whizzed past on scooters as I sat in Beijing traffic on wide avenues lined with towering skyscrapers. I even laughed when I heard the usually annoying high-pitched alert that vans and scooters play when they reverse. On bridges across the city, there were red propaganda banners touting Xi Jinping doctrine. It's one of the many ways Xi ensures his presence is felt every day in China. He has songs dedicated to him. Three and a half minutes of pure adulation about Xi Dada, Uncle Xi. Shidada, how people line the streets for you. Shidada, how we all love you. Shidada, how people of the world love you. His books fill the windows of bookshops. And when you turn on the TV these days, chances are the story will be about him and his policies. All positive, of course. But Xi mania goes much deeper. Xi isn't just the leader of the Chinese state. Thanks to the changes he's brought in, he is the Chinese state. None of this is by accident. Xi is 100% controlling the narrative around who he is and what he stands for. Imposing, awe-inspiring, beneficent. For China watchers, the parallel is clear. He's making himself into Chairman Mao Zedong 2.0. This is How to Become a Dictator with me, Sophia Yan. Step three, build a cult of personality. Okay, you've been really patient. I mentioned Mao in the very first episode, and now we'll finally dive deeper into China's founder. To do this, I've turned to Frank DeCotter, a historian and professor at Hong Kong University who specializes in the chairman and dictators in general. I set him the challenge of explaining Mao in a nutshell. Here goes. Mao Zedong was the leader of the Communist Party of China who came to power in 1949 after a bloody civil war carried out with massive support from the Soviet Union. Mao collectivized the economy and imposed all pervasive control over the lives of ordinary people. 1958, villagers were herded into giant collectives called people's communes. The experiment, referred to as the Great Leap Forward, backfired terribly as tens of millions starved to death. At this point, Mao became worried that party leaders might blame him for the disaster, and in 1966 launched the Cultural Revolution to purge the party of real or imaginary enemies. Soon enough, people from all walks of life, from leading officials down to ordinary people, were forced to denounce each other, including their own relatives, friends or neighbors, in order to save themselves. Loyalty to the chairman became paramount and remained the leading motive of a series of relentless political campaigns all the way to his death in 1976. Ultimate loyalty. That's the requirement at the heart of Mao's regime. And he kicks that off by creating a strong cult of personality. What do I mean by that? Frank defines it quite simply. Fear. Cult of personality is the appearance of love, which very much hides fear. You might think of giant statues, endless posters, and mass chants when you hear 
cult of personality. Those are all part of it, as could be seen in extreme at the height of Mao's cultural revolution in the 1960s and 70s. Songs about him were played on loudspeakers everywhere you went. Factories, offices, schools. Everyone had to carry around his little red book, a volume of Mao quotes. You will have to get up in the morning and bow to a portrait of the chairman uh, in your own home or dormitory. You might even have to perform a little dance called the loyalty dance to prove, not just to yourself, but to others around you, that you are truly loyal to him. Uh, It's a total and complete commitment to a person who is represented as not just a genius, but a god. It becomes a religion that very much shapes every part of your daily life. And in the end, I will monitor myself. I might wake up in the middle of the night afraid of having had a dream in which I say something critical of the very man in charge. That is the cult of personality. The surveillance of people's, or the attempt to surveil people's minds. It taps into the number one thing that unites all dictators, a theme we have returned to over and over again in this podcast. Total control. Since coming to power, she has been pursuing the same thing, and it has not gone unnoticed. And I think that you can very much see the same thing at work as Xi Jinping not only purges his enemies within the ranks, party members, but also cranks up the surveillance states. And hand in hand with repression comes the cult of personality. By 2016, 17, you will see very much posters of Xi Jinping, his portrait on trinkets, on pots, and on posters and books, his... Uh, you know, collected writings taught in schools. So there are very clear parallels there, not just between Xi Jinping and and Mao Zedong, but with other dictators throughout the 20th century. Just like Mao, she wants to be on a pedestal and universally adored, so powerful that no one dares to question him. He wants not just Mao's power, but also his stature, his legacy. To build a cult of personality on that level, she has relied on two things, propaganda and censorship. Let's start with the propaganda. Remember those years that she said he spent living in caves? It's the core of the legend he's created around himself. Every hero needs a founding myth. And now that I'm back in China, I'm going to go visit them myself. I'm standing now in the village where Xi Jinping spent seven years of his youth during the Cultural Revolution. It's a set of caves. And inside these caves, you see really modest surroundings. All right, I've come into one of the first caves, a little dark, a little damp, very modest. There's a a platform to sleep on with a small desk, blankets folded in the corner. I suppose this is a recreation of what it would have been like at the time. There are some old photos, and it's of the people who were here with Xi. I'm trying to find him in this picture. And there he is, a young Xi. He's tall, skinny, and kind of lanky. And then at the center, right above where he would have slept, probably cooked and ate, is a picture of him with a bag slung over his left shoulder. This picture is everywhere. You see it in the books that have been published with his writings and speeches. You see it all the time also in state media and propaganda. This is a picture that is very iconic of Yang Shi, of the years that he spent here. It's a little dusty in here. China might be a one-party state, but so much focus on a Chinese leader's personal backstory is actually unusual. 
After the disastrous egomania of Mao, the party put in guardrails to prevent that from happening again. Instead, officials started to emphasize collective experience and decision-making, rather than relying on one person. But not Xi. From the minute he took power, propaganda focused on him, his personal life, and what he thought. That's why the caves he lived in were turned into a tourist attraction. Chinese officials are even required to come here to learn about Xi and the party's history. So I'm standing now in another cave. There's some old furniture, some tin cups and bowls, tin teapot. There's some old historic posters that say, Long live Mao. Long live Chairman Mao Zedong. Long live, long, long, long live Mao. Also here, there are old propaganda posters about the sent down youth, these young, very hardy, ruddy-cheeked youths presented. You know, their arms are outspread. This area was a major revolutionary base where Mao plotted his rise to establish the People's Republic of China. Don't forget, Xi's dad was also once a Mao confidant. It all builds into the lore around Xi a way to emphasize his red, red roots and to reinforce his right to rule forever. But unlike Mao, who relied solely on posters, slogans, songs, and fear, Xi has an extra tool at his fingertips. Technology. First, he demanded the state TV channel to remember its job, to serve the party. Good morning, President Xi! That's from a 2016 visit to the Beijing headquarters of CCTV. It's guarded by the military. Mm Mm-hmm. It really is called CCTV. It stands for China Central Television. You have to wonder if someone at the top had a keen sense of irony or felt like putting up a middle finger to the West. CCTV broadcasts in six different languages, pumping out positive stories about Xi's China. The government channel boasts more than one billion viewers around the globe. Then there's the app, Study Xi, Strong Nation. Yep, Xi has his own app, and using it is mandatory for anyone linked to the state. Faceless bureaucrats to local party bosses to soldiers. We're talking tens of millions of people. Xi Jinping, Tan Zhi Guo Li Zheng, the fourth quarter. The app has a lot of patriotic music and a lot of red. And it dives into the nitty-gritty of Xi's doctrine, Xi Jinping thought, also known as XJPXSDZGTSSHZYSX. That's the abbreviation. No joke. In Chinese, it's Xi Jinping, Xin Shidai Zhong Guo Te Se Shi Hui Zhu Yi Si Xiao. In English, it's Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. The name alone gives you a sense of how tedious it is to use this app. It's all about Xi's ideology, understanding it, analyzing it, applying it. His blueprint on how to make China great again, so to speak. One, national rejuvenation to restore China's glory. Two, The party is the country's best and only option to do that. And three, a strong leader, she, of course, to lead the way. Here's a taste of some of the courses. Number four, Xi Jinping ecological civilization thought. Number six, cores and keys. What's a kind of socialism with Chinese characteristics will we uphold and develop in the new era? Also some practical learning. Number 10. Health starts from the heart. Number 12. Sleep problems and their prevention for workplace employees. At the end is a quiz, and my producer Venetia thought it would be hilarious to make me do it. So here goes. Okay, question one. On January 12, 2016, General Secretary Xi Jinping's speech at the 6th Plenary Session of the 18th Central Commission for Discipline Inspection said that officials had gone wrong because they had what? A. Bad manners B. Bad characters C. Not enough Communist Party spirit or D. Problems with their family traditions Mm, B. Bad character? I'm sorry, that's the wrong answer. It was C. Not enough Communist Party spirit. 
Oh, I should have done that. <laughs> okay, question two. On November 6 and 7, 2018, General Secretary Xi Jinping stressed during his visit to Shanghai that garbage classification work is what? A, the new fashion, B, the new custom, C, the new trend, or D, the new craze? Um, okay, B, the new custom. I'm sorry, that's wrong. It's A, the new fashion. No. <laughs> <laughs> We're talking about garbage classification work here. Just want to remind our listeners. <laughs> right. Question three. In a speech on December 18, 2018, Xi Jinping pointed out that in the past 40 years of reform and opening up, the theme of our party's entire theory and practice has been adherence to and development of what? A. Socialist revolution. B. New democracy. C. Socialism with Chinese characteristics. Or D, socialist construction? I think it's C. That's correct. Socialism with oh, Chinese characteristics. <laughs> okay, barely failing. <laughs> <laughs> if you found yourself zoning out slightly during that, don't worry, you're not alone. Getting through the app's long-winded content is so boring that people have come up with hacks, plugins to auto-scroll through the courses on your behalf and speed up the videos. <laughs> But Xi Jinping thought isn't just for cadres. Universities have established research centers to study this. Even children have to learn about it. Telegraph researcher Jenny Pan spoke to a school teacher through an intermediary to protect his identity. He says she now permeates everything. Whether it's exams for Chinese chemistry or politics, it has to cite quotes from the boss to promote core ideology. And they've enhanced patriotic education, ideas such as attacking Taiwan or anti-US and pro-Russia messages with a clear slant. Students have become very anti-American as a result. He says it's brainwashing students and teachers. But I'm not one of them. I think I should put students' interests first. Still, Many times there are things we don't dare to say because our fate is in the hands of others. Sometimes I'm really impressed by the party's ability to brainwash people to this extent. Parents have told me that they can no longer tell the difference between classes focused on political ideology and everything else, even gym class. A whole generation basically no longer getting a full, proper education but they are going to be able to recite Xi Jinping thought by heart. She's certainly making good on his whole Mao 2.0 project. But to fully do it, there is one thing left. He would have to replace the chairman in the heart of Beijing, Tiananmen Square. Just driving down Chang'an Avenue along Tiananmen Square. I'm in a taxi going by because I, as a foreign journalist, am no longer allowed onto Tiananmen Square. To my left is Tiananmen Gate, where Chairman Mao's portrait has hung since 1949, when the People's Republic of China was founded. This is the heart of Beijing, and therefore of China. The symbolism of Mao's portrait here is hard to overstate. You have to wonder, does she want to see his portrait up there instead? And if so, how long might it be before that happens? What is he going to do to shore up his legacy in order to get his picture up there? This is something I asked Frank DeCotter if he thought Mao's portrait would ever be removed from its hallowed place. Well, I certainly hope it will. I just hope it won't be replaced by anyone's portrait. Maybe a portrait of the people, that would be nice. It's a tantalizing but taboo thought, and one that in Xi's China would quickly be censored. More on that after the break. My name's Louisa Wells. I'm head of podcasts at The Telegraph, which means it's basically my job to listen to shows like this one all day on work time. Pretty good gig if you ask me. But it also means I get to commission podcasts like How to Become a Dictator, shows which shine a light on human rights issues and very real threats to democracy. And putting shows like this together takes a team of journalists, and that's where our subscribers come in. Without their support, we wouldn't have the funds to make journalism like this. So, to become one of them, 
And to get unlimited access to all of The Telegraph's journalism, head to telegraph.co.uk slash dictator, where you can get 30 days free access to The Telegraph online. That's telegraph.co.uk slash dictator, or click on the link in the show notes to this episode. Propaganda is one thing, but there will always be some people who don't buy it, or worse, criticize it. To deal with them, she has turned to censorship. It has become a defining feature of life in China today. To show you how unrelenting it can be, I've come to a restaurant. A steamed bun restaurant, to be precise. Stick with me. I'm sitting in a little eatery in West Beijing. In front of me, I have an orange tray. And on top of that tray, I've got a plate of pork and scallion steamed buns, a bowl of stewed pig liver, and a plate of vegetables. It's the same meal that she ate when he visited this place in 2013. He showed up one day, got in line with other customers, and ordered his own meal. He paid for his meal with his own money. He even carried his own tray to a table so that he could eat the steam buns. The whole thing was over in about 20 minutes. It was a way for Xi to say, I'm one of you. But people went nuts over this visit. Photos went viral online. State media making a big show of how she really was the everyman. The restaurant itself saw a whole ton of customers come in, people wanting to order the president's meal. I think the nation's leader here doing a very ordinary thing was absolutely extraordinary. This is not something that happens in China. But the propaganda wasn't a total success. Some people ridiculed him for trying to portray himself as a man of the people. They gave him a nickname, Steam Bun Shi, Shi Baozi. That's pretty inoffensive as nicknames go. Leaders in other countries get called much worse. But Shi does not take teasing well. His new nickname quickly became a censored term on social media. In 2017, a man who typed Steam Bun Shi in private texts to friends was sentenced to two years in prison. This sensitivity around Xi is why people try to avoid talking about him, even in a veiled way, because no insult is seen as too small. Take Winnie the Pooh. A picture circulated online of Xi walking with then U.S. President Barack Obama next to an illustration of Pooh Bear and his friend Tigger. After that, poor Pooh got censored. Remember Uncle Shi, Shi Dada? That got axed too, but it's unclear why. Experts wondered if the focus on Shi had backfired as the world started to see China as increasingly autocratic. But that's just the start of it. The Great Firewall of China means Shi can censor anything and everything. Let me take you through what it's like to use the internet in China. Okay, I am logging into my laptop. And I'm going to do something I try almost never to do, which is to turn my VPN off. This is honestly terrifying. (laughs) If I turn off my VPN, that means I am only surfing the internet within China. The VPN allows me to what we say in Chinese, fan chang, which is to literally like jump over the wall. All right, here's google.com. It just looks like it's loading. Nothing will ever actually come up. So Twitter actually has given me a little message. Something went wrong, but don't fret. Let's give it another shot. Okay, Twitter, let's try it again. Blocked. You know, it's just not going to work here in China. We can go onto Weibo. This is China's version of Twitter. Well, for fun, let's search Xi Jinping in Chinese. Sorry, there are no search results for Xi Jinping. Wow, that's really fascinating. That's like going onto Twitter and searching Liz Truss or Joe Biden and getting no search results. Imagine that on the eve of an election. That's sort of what's happening now. Okay, so I'm just searching for Xi Baozi. This is the 
term that someone got in trouble for. None. I really hope that this isn't going to get me into trouble because all the searches when you're on the Chinese internet, it's all tracked. I'm going to search <laughs> Xijiang, Duli, Tibetan independence. Okay, I hope, I really hope I don't get in trouble for this. Also blocked. All right, I'm going to stop searching banned words on the internet. It's probably fine, probably fine. I'm a foreigner. This is the internet in our news bureau, a foreign news bureau. If you're Chinese and doing this, you could possibly get in pretty serious trouble, especially now. So I don't want to push the envelope too, too much on that front. Censorship happens offline, too, to people who criticize Xi. A woman who live-streamed herself throwing ink on a poster of Xi in 2018 was disappeared, along with her father. This year, he died in prison. Then there's China's Donald Trump, outspoken tycoon Ren Zhiqiang. A Chinese billionaire has been given 18 years in prison for a variety of corruption charges. He called Xi a clown. But many suspect the real reason for the conviction is that he spoke out. But that's not all. She's censoring history itself. It's now a crime to dispute the party's official version of events. And that version, of course, means the party can do no wrong. She thinks the Soviet Union fell apart because its leaders lost control of the historical narrative. He's determined not to repeat the same mistake. The result is that everything available for public consumption must face the red pens of Beijing's army of censors, including things from outside of China that have nothing to do with Xi. Lots of foreign music, movies, and books never make it in at all. If they do, whole sections are often deleted in order to meet Xi's exacting idea of propriety. Or to remove anything China doesn't agree with. British children's cartoon Peppa Pig was axed in a broader campaign against undue Western influence. She was deemed too subversive after somehow becoming a symbol of counterculture. Go figure. And then there's Lord of War. Selling guns is like selling vacuum cleaners. A Hollywood blockbuster about a notorious real-life arms dealer played by Nicolas Cage. Can you bring me the gun of Spoiler alert, the original movie ends with him getting out of prison and returning to crime. But the version available to stream in China cuts the last 30 minutes and replaces it with some text saying the bad guy confessed everything and was sentenced to life. You might be wondering why she cares about all this. Kind of seems silly. Doesn't he have better things to do, like run the world's most populous country? But it's about something bigger. There's only one way to think, behave, and act. And that way is dictated by one man. Bottom line. There is only one reality in Xi's China. Plenty happened during Xi's first term in power, but it had yet to raise eyebrows and draw international condemnation. Propaganda and censorship? Well, that's sort of expected. China was too important, too vital to global growth to rock the boat. As the world's second largest economy, it represented trillions of pounds in trade for the U.S., U.K., and others. Plus, many nations thought China would move toward greater freedom, not less. Maybe even democracy, as its citizens grew richer. And it was easy to be swayed by Xi. He was good at international showmanship in those early years. Like that tractor he drove in Iowa. Oops, there we go. <laughs> and all the big speeches he gave when he'd reel off local literature classics a way to claim he was well-read. In return, the global elite feted him, applauded him when he spoke at Davos in Switzerland in 2017. Mr. President, it was a very, very important speech. Entertained him. Trump's granddaughter sang a Chinese song for him on a visit to Mar-a-Lago the same year. And toasted him when she visited the UK in 2015. Then Prime Minister David Cameron invited the Chinese leader to his local to share a pint. The plough at Cadston in Buckinghamshire, about 45 miles out of London. It's quite surreal, isn't it? 
most powerful man in the world was standing right here having a pint. Over the summer, I went there one evening to retrace his steps with my producer, Venetia. Look at that, China Daily, State Media. There's the pint. They lounged at the bar and had a Green King IPA together. Just two lads out for a brew. This was the first visit by a Chinese leader to the UK in 10 years. It marked a pivotal moment in ties between the two countries. Cameron even mentions it in his memoir. According to Cameron's memoir, they wanted to show that she was a man of the people, the Chinese side. And so Cameron's team suggested that they should go to a pub and do a very traditional English thing. Have a pint, have fish and chips. (laughs) And so that's what they did. And I believe you've got David Cameron's autobiography there in front of you. Should I read some of this? Okay, so it was a chance for me to spend some time with Xi. He has a confident and bullish exterior. He sees himself very much as the big leader in the mold of Mao and Deng and projects that image. But behind the scenes, I found him reflective and thoughtful. And the pub was a hit. Such a hit that the pub commemorated it with paraphernalia. Do you get a lot of Chinese tourists here? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. They like to kind of walk in the same footsteps that um, he walks in. (laughs) What were his footsteps? We used to have them on the floor. We take them off, but just, yeah. (laughs) You used to have them on the floor? Like the stickers, yeah. (laughs) Those footsteps may be gone, but the pint with Cameron was another way to shape Xi's image. Are you a local here? Yeah. Pub regular Tom Blood was there that night and remembers it well. I was a bit like, oh, what's going on? They wouldn't tell me anything. So where I was sitting here, they had a man armed here and then in the car parks as well. And then and then he had two men beside him. It was hard to come in and have a drink. We had to wait for him to sit down there before we could come to the bar and have a drink. Yeah. Did you know who he was when you saw him? Mm, not really. Very quiet, though. He sort of kept himself to himself when he was here. He breathes the same air we do. <laughs> Not that you would have thought it from the reception she got. During that 2015 trip, the UK cut no corners. She spent two nights at Buckingham Palace and attended a lavish state banquet hosted by the Queen. Your visit to the United Kingdom marks a milestone in this unprecedented year of cooperation and friendship between the United Kingdom and China. All the excitement over Xi's visit and China reflected how the UK, like many nations, hoped to advance trade ties. China was selling the idea too, under its Belt and Road Plan. 30 billion pounds in trade and investment deals were announced between the UK and China, covering everything from energy to online retail. The banner deal? And I'm pleased to announce today that we're signing an historic deal to build the Hinkley nuclear power station. Such a visit would be inconceivable now. Everything has changed. Then, of a golden era in UK-China relations. now dubbed the golden error. Instead of cooperation, the US and the UK talk about competition, about coercion. Trade is still massive, but ongoing COVID lockdowns in China have shut down supply chains. Many British companies are trying to reduce their reliance on Chinese factories. That nuclear plant, given Chinese involvement and access, now faces scrutiny over national security concerns. And the current British government is the most hawkish on China in decades. Knowledge that China is a threat to our national security. It's a threat to our economic security. But we also need to stand up for our values. Tellingly, David Cameron did not agree to speak to me for this podcast. Another nail in the coffin in the UK-China relationship came earlier this year when she failed to denounce Vladimir Putin after Russia invaded Ukraine. She has now gone from friend to foe. But as the pub trip with Cameron shows, in Xi's early years, he worked hard to use propaganda to build a cult of personality, not just at home, but also abroad. We're going to look at that in more depth in episode four. But first, I need to come clean with you about something. I didn't tell you the full story about my trip to the caves where she lived as a teenager. The truth is, I really couldn't do much reporting. After I registered at the security station near the front of the entrance of the caves, there's a little tourist shuttle, a little shuttle bus that takes you closer to the actual sites. And as soon as I got on the shuttle, three other people got on with me. Minders who are following me still right now. 
Despite having been in China for a decade, I was quite shocked. This wasn't Xinjiang. I wasn't conducting a major investigation. I was at a popular government tourist site. Pure propaganda. When I came in, they already told me that I was not allowed to do any interviews here and that I wasn't allowed to take any videos. And I asked why, and the officer at the front, the police officer, said, there's no why. There are, there are no whys. He says, it just comes from above. This is something I hear a lot in China. There are no whys. So I, I suppose these people following me are trying to make sure I don't actually talk to anybody here. I've learned to recognize minders and plainclothes police. But even without that knowledge, these guys were not being subtle. And some of them have taken their jackets off, and on the inside, the lining of the jacket, it actually says police. So <laughs> it's, it's very clear who they are. This is what reporting in China is like. <laughs> it's incredible. The intimidation and harassment got worse the longer I stayed. I think now there are 12. They just keep increasing in number. And uh, there's a whole bunch of people taking photos of me now. Oh, I was told I can't go any further. There's actually a lot more here to see. There are many more caves. And, well, they didn't tell me any reason. I think this is all because I'm here. There's the now two cop cars. The guy who was telling me I couldn't go forward was getting a message on his walkie-talkie to say, figure out what she's up to, basically. I think it's time to go. I expect some hassle on every reporting trip, but this was out of control. To make sure my reporting wouldn't be censored as well, I decided to take an extra precaution. I've come into a bathroom now to try to upload all these files in case on my way out. I get stopped and searched and they try to delete these. It was a sign of just how sensitive it had become to report anything about Xi, let alone China. And you know what? After a decade of putting up with things pretty much falling off a cliff, I think I've finally reached my limit. That might seem crazy. I've had way more difficult reporting trips. But it's snowballing. All the intimidation, all the times I've been harassed, all the death threats online. This experience at the caves was the last straw. I just don't feel safe here anymore. Nobody knows where China's red lines are these days. I'm also exhausted by three years of zero COVID, the endless uncertainty and extreme surveillance. After being back only one week, I already feel trapped by it all. For a long time, I tolerated the ever-growing list of restrictions because I loved covering and discovering China. I still do. But now, if I can't even report on the official narrative and the risks are mushrooming, then what's the point of being here? So I've made a tough decision. I'm going to leave China for good. It's a risk. The government could easily ban me from doing that. It has used foreign journalists as pawns. But I have to try. You've been listening to How to Become a Dictator with me, Sophia Yan, China correspondent for The Telegraph. Reporting by me with additional research by Jenny Pan. The producers are Venetia Rainey and Yulaine Gofan. Sound design is by Giles Gear with original music by Elliot Lampett. The executive producer is Louisa Wells and the commissioning editor is Louis Emanuel. Follow this feed on your podcast app to make sure you don't miss an episode.